Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features X-Men Volume 2, number 55, cover dated August 1996. The cover is by Andy Kubert, inked by John Dell, featuring a combination of the X-Men and the Avengers, as well as the Fantastic Four, because we're now into Onslaught Phase 1. Uh, Twilight of the Heroes is the title of this particular phase and this is the build up to Heroes Reborn that is the transfer of some of Marvel's key titles and characters including Fantastic Four, Captain America and the Avengers to the hands, the creative hands of Jim Lee and Rob Liefeld for one year as it turned out. But this cover, back to the cover, is a very cool one by Andy Kubert featuring the Sentinels. The last time he got to draw those was in the Age of Apocalypse storyline. Um, maybe he had a yen or a hankering to draw them again and he does a pretty good job of them in this particular issue. And everybody's crowded all around the Statue of Liberty because really that's kind of like the theme. It is the potential loss of liberty in the face of Onslaught who is about to become ruler of the entire world if his ambitions are fulfilled. So let's open this one up to the first page. And it begins in a midtown Manhattan apartment at 6 a.m. This particular denizen worker of the city, um, he's got a rather interesting name, Stu Pfaffenberger. Um, he's rising and shining and thinking about how cramped his apartment is. In fact, though, this dump has only got one thing going for it, the view. So as he opens the curtains, what's he met with except for the face, the inanimate face of a sentinel. So what is going on? And this is something that was teased at the end of X-Men Onslaught, uh, that Onslaught had a plan for the sentinels. And we're gonna see what that plan is in this particular issue. So nice artwork, nice storytelling on this page by Andy Kubert. Let's turn over and we get a double page spread, but it's one of these ones where I'm gonna to have to turn it sideways. And you get a big panorama there. Wait till I get this right, the fold in the middle of the double page spread. You get a big panorama of New York City, Manhattan. Title of the story there, Invasion. The creative team, Mark Wade, uh, for the, uh, credited for the story. Andy Cooper for the pencils. Dan Panosian on inks. And the rest of the creative team, Joe Rosas Colors, Malibu on the digital enhancements, and Richard Starkings on Comicraft on the digital lettering. So that is a very, very cool double page spread. Andy Kubert going for some epic shots in this particular issue. And of course, smack in the middle of the page, we have a big New York landmark that is the Empire State Building. Okay, so let's continue with the story here. And we see a few more uh, New York City landmarks, including the Brooklyn Bridge getting smashed here. The Sentinels have landed in New York, declares the third person narration hard. A phalanx of robotic drones. They were originally designed to protect humanity from the so-called mutant menace. Protection is no longer on their agenda. Instead, they prowl the Manhattan streets, sealing every entrance and exit to the island with surgical precision. Now, I don't think that smashing up the Brooklyn Bridge is really the definition of surgical precision, but I do like this particular panel and the combination of the third person narration and the image. 17 minutes start to finish and no one dares raise a hand against them. Just as we see a shot of the Statue of Liberty with the hand raised, the torch of liberty there, and the sentinel kind of quizzically looking at it. Um, that's a pretty cool little shot there that Andy Kubrick came up with. And we're looking at the south of Manhattan Island with the twin towers there. It is 1996, so they're still there. And you can just see the detail of Four Freedoms Plaza as well. I like that. So, um, no one dares to raise a hand against them. No one save those gathered atop Four Freedoms Plaza. They watch and they know with sinking realization and get ready for another double page spread that they are the hope of the world. That is very, very cool by Kubert. So we've got um, the characters from the cover there. We've got various members of the Avengers from this particular time period. So Captain America, they're very prominent. We also have um, Giant Man, 
um, we have the Black Widow, uh, Iron Man, Vision, uh, we've got Crystal and Quicksilver, and we've got the Scarlet Witch. And from the Fantastic Four, we have the Thing here, uh, we have Reed Richards and his wife Sue, and do I see Johnny Storm anywhere there? I can't see him, so he's not in this particular room. Oh, there he is. Um, so he's not in his Human Torch form. And we also have a few X-Men, including Bishop there, um, Iceman, any other X-Men present? No, that's it for the moment. And they're at top four Freedoms Plaza and they're looking across Manhattan. That's a really great um, image. So there's a little bit of kind of catch up for readers in the dialogue here regarding Professor X and his transformation into Onslaught and the fact that the clock is ticking in terms of whether they're going to be able to save Charles from himself, as Captain America says, before he conquers all of Earth. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention Thor there too. So let's continue with the story. We have Captain America there, um, a nice close up on him with Bishop saying, we suspect that Magneto had something to do with Onslaught's ascendance. I'm disappointed you failed to locate him. He says to Captain America, imagine expressing disappointment to the leader of the Avengers like that. In fact, Bishop says the captain, we did find him. And that's a reference to Avengers number 401. And just at that moment, um, Magneto arrives with Rogue in tow, as well as a fairly miffed looking Gambit and other members of uh, the Avengers of that particular era, including Hawkeye there. So uh, Magneto's mysteriously de-aged and apparently purged of his criminal tendencies. He's not our problem. In fact, he's anxious to help. And the captain says, we also found Rogue at his side. I didn't realize those two were close, but um, for long time readers, their closeness goes all the way back to issue 269, 274 and 275 of Uncanny X-Men, the Savage Land storyline. So the captain asks uh, Bishop and Iceman here, what went on here in the meantime? Nothing good says Reed Richards, we confronted Onslaught directly, that is in Fantastic Four 415, and Iceman and Bishop are shocked to see Rogue and Magneto together. That's a nice little um, city shot there of the Manhattan skyline, um, so we get to see a water tower there, and uh, again another shot of Four Freedoms Plaza. What happened in Fantastic Four number 415 was that um, Onslaught kidnapped Franklin Richards, presumably to add the boy's reality bending powers to his own. And Reed is of the opinion no, no one knows where, well he says no one knows where Onslaught went, but clearly the Sentinels are his handiwork. So now we get a little uh, quarrel between fire and ice here. Um, so the two hotheads of uh, the various teams um, kind of butting heads and Sue Richards um, in intervenes to get them to stop bickering. We've got work to do together. Nice top down shot there from um, the rooftop of Four Freedoms Plaza, looking all the way down at the Sentinels roaming the streets and avenues of Manhattan. And we have a little moment here between Magneto and Rogue. Magneto going by the name Joseph at this point. And um, Magneto completely wiped of his memories um, from and from the time up to the time that he fell from Avalon um, back in issue, I'm trying to remember the specific issue, something like 42, 43 of Adjectiveless X-Men. So um, Magneto asks here, what kind of man could be responsible for such a thing as what's going on in Manhattan? And Rogue responds, and of course there's lots of irony, to the word she uses, a lost soul, a man driven to desperate measures by those who would persecute him. And of course that could be applied to Magneto himself um, up to this time period and rogue sympathy for him. We have to do what we can to save him. She is talking about Professor X and she continues and says, and give him a second chance to make things right. But the person that she hasn't given a second chance to, or maybe really a third chance, is Gambit. So after their kiss in Israel prior to Age of Apocalypse, she was perturbed by what she found in his memories, but also she blocked out what she found in his memories, Gambit's dark secret, 
and he thinks to himself here, tender speech share, I only wonder this, you talking about Charles or Magneto himself? Don't sound like your new friend much recollects the sins of his own past. How fair you reckon that is. And of course, Gambit remembers the sins of his past. So lots of little ironies um, floating or swirling around these characters. Um, and that's pretty well done by Mark Wade. <clears throat> um, and then Captain America. And at this time period, it's interesting to note that Wade wrote Avengers 401 and 402 as well as um, finishing up a, a critically acclaimed and increasingly read run of Captain America, the, um, the, the Captain's own title uh, with, ink, with uh, art by Ron Garney. And you know, they were pretty miffed to be replaced by, um, to, be, to have their run um, interfered with or stopped rather by Heroes Reborn and to be replaced by Rob Liefeld. None of them happy about that. Um, <clears throat> so here we've got a big anchor image of the combined teams going into action. And um, the captain gives the orders. Thor's team on the east side, Quicksilver's squad can cover um, Soho. So off they go on their various missions to uh, tackle the Sentinels. And Reed Richards says they'll defend the streets Giant Man, Iron Man, Bishop, follow me to the lab. It's up to us to construct some offensive weaponry. And Sue adds, concerned about her son and some sort of tracking device. Of course, says Reed, you have my word, Sue. We'll find Franklin. So Franklin always going missing. Um, certainly that is uh, one of the uh, plot devices that hover around Fra Franklin Richards when he's a child. And here he is elsewhere, but we're not given the precise location. It's somewhere in the astral, on the astral plane, I would say. And Franklin is in the grasp of Onslaught, as well as his imaginary friend here, Lil Charlie, who is, of course, um, a facet of Onslaught. And they're trying to bring Franklin over to their side. Um, and little Charlie says to Franklin here, your own daddy tried to shut your powers down once. He was so scared of you, you remember that. And that's a, uh, a call back to deep uh, Marvel continuity, issue 141 of Fantastic Four. Well, Onslaught says little Charlie can fix it so no one has to be scared anymore, no one. With your help, child, I can build a place that will keep us safe. Concentrate, concentrate, Franklin, says Onslaught. So we'll see what that place is towards the conclusion of this issue. Then the scene switches to the Blackbird. Most of the issue is um, very plot driven. Um, so the scene switches to the Blackbird, which is coming from Moor Isle. And the X-Men who were summoned there by Moor MacTaggart have been given uh, by her, the Xavier Protocols. Um, and these concern Archangel, Beast, Bishop, Cannonball, Cyclops, Gambit, Iceman, Psylocke, Rogue, Storm, Wolverine, and Professor X himself. Cyclops says as he's skimming the Protocols, he knows our strengths, our weaknesses. What possible chance do we have against him? My God, um, he um, exclaims. And Jean says, Scott, I know this is hitting you hard, we're fighting a man who's like a father to both of us. Just remember, inside Onslaught is a good man named Charles Xavier. We'll get to him. We will. But Cyclops pauses and says, well, not if he gets to us first. That's a nice panel idea there. So we've got a borderless final panel and a tight close-up on Cyclops' uh, face and bleeding off the page. Keeps it interesting by Kubert. And so then the scene switches to Four Freedoms Plaza and Reed Richards' lab. And um, we've got everyone examining various things in the lab, including his father, Nathaniel Richards' armor that he used to shield himself from Franklin's power. So he's asking Iron Man in particular what he makes of it. So uh, Iron Man takes a look, neural netwebbed, fully tessellated. This is a must salvage, he says. And Giant Man, Hank Pym says, okay, 
So we can cobble up something impervious to Franklin's powers, but not necessarily to Xavier's. If we're going to take him, we'll need some ace in the hole. So this would appear to be, um, is this Cyclops holding the Xavier protocols or has it been sent? I mean, we do have the internet in 1996. Has it been sent to read? Because this psionic armor here, that is Professor X's strategy against himself, should he ever go insane, is the psionic armor that we've seen Professor X wear in the Shadow King saga. So, for example, issues 279 and 280 of Uncanny X-Men. So, these are the seeds for an ultimate defeat of Onslaught. Then we're looking back at um, uh, what's going on in the streets of Manhattan. So we've got Rockefeller Plaza here and uh, we have the torch uh, burning one of those sentinels. And then we have a nice little panel here of Thor and Hawkeye. I don't know how, well, okay, so Hawkeye presumably has some um, arrows with explosive heads. Um, that way he could take out a sentinel. Thor, of course, could take them all out, really, if he had enough time. Statue of Liberty there in the background. Then down on the southern tip of Manhattan, we've got the Twin Towers again. And Captain America uh, taking out a Sentinel with a shield. In Midtown, Rogue and Magneto pool their strategy. Magnetism topples the Sentinels, while Super Strength totals them. So these two working as a pretty good duo and that's what rogue says we make quite a pair that we do says magneto in the short time i've known you rogue you've impressed me to no end comforts me to realize that in a crisis i can count on but he's saved by the intervention of gambit who's stalking the pair sorry if i'm crashing a private party he says not at all says magneto we must do what we can to stop this madness and then Gambit drops a clanger, especially Mon Ami, since it's your fault. So Rogue isn't going to be happy about that one. We'll see that shortly. Um, she protests there, watch your mount, Remy. Shut it for I should it, and she was about to say for you. When Iceman intervenes to save them all from a sentinel with his ice powers. Um, and he's, there, he's asked, any word from home base? Not yet. The big brains are still tinkering, racing the clock, but I think time just ran out. Look over Central Park. So here we go. Yes, this is kind of like um, the, the plot is fast paced in this issue and we've got big anchor images and an implication of epic scope. And I think that Kubert handles that well in the art. It starts like a dawning sun the air fills with light as we're looking over Central Park there. And this is the Chrysler building um, that flares with a Nova flash. No, it's not the Chrysler building. Um, hmm. Ah, it's the building, if I'm not wrong, it's the building from Go the Ghostbusters movie, the hotel. Yes, and that's on the west side of Central Park. Anyway, um, here we see what um, Onslaught has Franklin Richards help him build in the middle of Central Park, Park, an Ebon Citadel that dwarfs the tallest skyscrapers in its shadow. All right, and here we get another huge anchor image of Onslaught um, out on a balcony and making a big villain's announcement to the whole human race. And here in the background, we have the Empire State Building. He says, Homo sapiens, hear the words of Onslaught. From this day forward, the humans shall no longer inherit the earth. No more shall mutant kind be so savagely oppressed. For today marks the ultimate ascendance of the Homo superior race. People of the world, he says. We've got to turn the page to find out what he's going to say next. Um, the Avengers are moving. How are they going to get from where they were uh, towards the southern end of Manhattan up to Central Park. It's just not possible. Um, Captain said, the Captain America says, move in, move in before. And this is what he says, behold my mighty hand. So he knocks them all out. The shockwave hits like a comet. With a gesture, 
chillingly casual onslaught blankets Manhattan with a coruscating blast of unearthly energy. So that's what we see here, an electromagnetic pulse so fierce as to uproot the very bedrock of the island. So Manhattan always getting wrecked, always getting trashed in the Marvel Universe. Across the city it sparks explosions, it shatters buildings, it deadens every erg of power in its wake, turning subways, elevators, even operating rooms into silent tombs. I wonder what was the last time, when was the last time in the Marvel Universe that uh, Manhattan was really and truly trashed? Was it Inferno? Um, perhaps. Let's see. So another big anchor image of um, Onslaught here with a cold and exacting finality. It destroys circuitry. So that's going to impact the vision. It destroys armor, Iron Man taken out. It destroys hope. Everything that Reed was working on wrecked in his laboratory. And it even takes out the electronics of the approaching Blackbird so that it is in free fall and Angel's not able to do anything to stop it. No auxiliary power, no emergency tr thrusters. They are losing and it looks like they crash into the island. So is that the end of the X-Men? And then we have the wreckage. Manhattan really looks trashed once again. But uh, the four, uh, four mutants, Magneto, Gambit, Rogue and Iceman have survived. And Magneto understands what's happened. A surge of magnetic energy intensified by an unimaginable telekinetic might. So that is the combination of Magneto and Professor X's powers. It appears Onslaught has made his opening statement, dropping each and every one of us with his very first salvo. God help us, we're at his mercy. So Iron Man looks to be in particular trouble there. And uh, yeah, the heroes with slumped shoulders emerging from the wreckage. And that sign there looks like it's Park Avenue that they're on. And then the last page, Ozymandias is this character that's been popping up now and again. He formerly was the uh, Pharaoh of Egypt, but it was in his reign that Apocalypse emerged as a young mutant. And Apocalypse, when he got the upper hand over Ozymandias, enslaved him and condemned him to live underground in uh, North Africa and hammer away, chisel away at the walls and any other um, stone he gets his hands on with his visions of the future. And what he has visioned, envisioned today and sculpted from the stone is a glimpse of Onslaught. Not as he is, but as he will soon be, as he stands atop the ashes of what was once the earth. So is this a, um, is this a trustworthy um, a precognition of what is to come? And we can see Onslaught looking particularly monstrous there in his evolved form. Everything to be continued in Uncanny X-Men 336. But there is a bullpen, bullpen bulletins double page here. And finally, you get a little kind of guide uh, to, to the main spine of the, of the Onslaught storyline. And so here we have it. Like It all began with Onslaught X-Men. There's a review of that on the channel. Uncanny X-Men 335, that's been reviewed. And then also Cable 34, X-Men 18, Avengers 401, Fantastic uh, Four, 415, those two referenced in this particular issue. I have those comics in my collection. I may get around to reviewing them. Um, and then in July the next month, Phase 2, so you can see the various different titles there and issue numbers, and everything to be concluded in August with Onslaught Marvel Universe. Um, and I do have that in my collection, and I will get around to reviewing it. That's a pretty cool painting there of Onslaught with those sentinels around him and the various members of Avengers and Fantastic Four and um, it looks like one or two X-Men as well. And then at the end of the issue, we've got a couple of pages advertising um, the other two titles of Heroes Reborn. So here, Jim Lee talking about Iron Man. 
He's talking about bringing back Hydra to the forefront. He's talking about tinkering with um, Iron Man's origin. The new origin will be somewhat controversial, he says, but I think it makes sense. Iron Man and the Hulk, neither of them have ever had a prime sort of villain or motivation in their creation. Having the Hulk's origin tied into Iron Man's origin will be cool. So a lot of readers disagreed about that. Now that is a very cool drawing by Wills Portacio, inked by Scott Williams, of um, the new design for Iron Man. Uh, looks, of course, manga influenced, does look cool. Um, and then the last couple of pages regarding Rob Liefeld's plans for the Avengers. And he's saying, when the Avengers start out, the Avengers will start out as one thing and what they are by issue six are two totally different things. And he says he's having the time of his life. Jim Valentino is writing this series. It's his best work ever. I want to restore this stuff to being the best superheroes in the Marvel Universe. But if memory serves without checking, I don't think Jim Valentino wrote um, The Avengers. I think it was um, scripted by Jeff Loeb in the end. So there must have been some falling out or disagreement there between Liefeld and Valentino. Um, and you can see a little bit of Liefeld's artwork on Avengers. We've got Captain America there, Thor, Iron Man, and, um, and Captain America again. And of course, you know, infamously he changed the uh, symbol on the captain's uh, face mask, turning it into an eagle rather than um, an A. And then there's a letters page at the end of this issue. And uh, next month, the penultimate chapter in one of the greatest Marvel events of all time. You dare not miss it. There you go. I do hope that you enjoyed this review and commentary on Adjectiveless X-Men number 55. Let me know your thoughts on this in the comments section to the video. If you enjoyed my review and commentary, please like the video on YouTube. It really does help the channel. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this.